Hi and welcome back to the History Hut. I'm Jim, this is Dr. K and we're talking about Canada at war. So we've talked about some of the recruiting and stuff like that, but let's get into the, the juicy details. Uh, what was Canada's uh, first encounter with the enemy? Well, uh, after a, a, a taxing winter in in, uh, in Britain... They tax winters now? <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. And it was a wet winter, Man. so it was a taxed Just wet winter. Just a money grab. Oh, you're so Comes mean. every year. <laughs> after, after a terrible, terrible winter. A terrible winter. winter. Uh, and, of course, when I say winter, I mean British winter, which is mm. rain. Yeah. Kind of cold with rain. Kind of like summer. <laughs> yeah, just a lot, a lot like summer. They'll be taxing really. that next. Yeah, that's true. They're having summer there at the moment, I think, even though it's winter in a lot of other places. Although I'm not saying what it is here at all. I have no idea. It's neither here. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the first encounter with the enemy, this battle-hardened, well, they're not battle-hardened. They haven't been in battle yet, but they've certainly been well-trained, uh, is at Ypres. Uh, Y-P-R-E-S, and I think I said last time that the British referred to that as wipers <laughs> because they did like to have to pronounce things the French way, mm. you know, the kind of obstinate country, especially those English people. So uh, wipers or eep, so they, they actually faced the first poison gas attack of the war, and so it couldn't have got any worse if, you know, if you had, if you had tried. Uh, the Germans, of course, this is called a higher form of killing, and the Germans, of course, believed and hoped and prayed that this would be so horrific that the Allies would just say, well, that's up. You know, we give we give <laughs> in that that's it and, and you know it should have been because it, it just was so unexpected and, and so horrible um but of course it doesn't end the war at all far from it in fact what the allies start to do then is to get uh, gas poison gas in production on their side and it's even more unstable and dangerous because they have to then ship it across the english channel so you're actually bringing it across the english channel where there are german subs waiting to blow you <laughs> up so uh, even worse uh, but it is called a higher form of killing uh, they used chlorine gas first and um, a lot of people are familiar with that from that Brad Pitt movie, Legends of the Fall. Where at the I thought you were going to say the swimming pool. <laughs> at the beginning, very funny. Yes, that That's is where I'm recording. familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't even turn the water mm. green, which is yeah. really kind of odd. It does kill expect. the bacteria, though. It does. It does indeed. I think that's where we're going with they this. They say it does. So are you calling British soldiers bacteria? Because I hope not. Because mm, that would be very, not quite. That would be very no. bad. So chlorine gas, a product of the, the German industrial machine. They had eight chemical plants in the Ruhr Valley and uh, these were in full production during peacetime so they just upped the production during wartime and um, Fritz Haber was the, the father of chemical warfare and uh, the father of food additives that's quite the <laughs> quite yeah and uh, I wouldn't trust the food they, additives no, part I don't no, think no. Uh, he's probably responsible for the red food additives mm. so um, he won the Nobel Prize for his work in ammonia um, in 1919 that? after the war <laughs> Oh, you're just full of beans tonight. You see, I fed my co-host for once, and now I can't shut him up. It's yeah, Hunger Games. <laughs> oh, very funny. So, uh, so uh, this is serious stuff, man. So Fritz Haber, working at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, and he chose chlorine because it could be easily stored, and because, of course, it formed a green cloud <laughs> when it hit the mm. air. Yeah. And that was where I was going with my earlier reference to Legends of the Fall, because you cut me off at... Uh, because the you just see this green cloud coming across the the front lines, and of course everybody's like, "Oh, what is that?" Well, they they soon find out. Um, so Fritz Haber actually went to the Western Front to supervise the attack, and so this first attack runs for just over a month, April twenty second to May twenty fourth, and the Germans let out five hundred tons of chlorine gas, and uh, just absolutely a, a horrendous experience. And this is. Um, a soldier's account um, of a gas attack. A Canadian Lieutenant Colonel Ian Sinclair said, Our trenches were shortly filled with them crowding in uh, from out left. They were mostly blind and choking to death. And as fast as they died, they were heaved behind the trench. So just 
uh, just awful. And of course, um, what soldiers were told to do fairly quickly, uh, as it turns out, was to uh, soak their handkerchiefs in urine. So just pee on hankies or socks or towels or anything and then put it over their mouth. And that did actually help a little bit. That, uh, you know, obviously, uh, some kind of chemical reaction. So uh, Canadian troops were part of this first gas attack. So April 22nd, there's an artillery barrage usually ahead of it. And then the valves on 6,000 of the cylinders spread along a four mile front was was open. And uh, there had been uh, a convention at The Hague that you couldn't put poison gas in projectile canisters. So the <laughs> so naturally, the bad boys of the world are like, well, if we have them in canisters that we can just open and they can release into the air, we're not really breaking at any least there's international. Rules. You know, at yeah. least there's rules uh, yeah. to the game. Oh, that's, what, <laughs> that's what you're saying. No, you haven't been at a war. So all in all, you've got 160 tons of chlorine used and uh, a cloud anywhere from usually it was about five feet, a, a big green five foot cloud just rolling towards you. But sometimes it was even higher than that. So some men say, you know, up to 20 feet high and when it reached your side it stripped the linings of the soldiers lungs so it's just a case of breathing in a little bit stripped the lining of their lungs caused these violent coughing fits and then um they they finally their lungs just ruptured and they died so you didn't Ooh. actually have very long and there's no protection against it at all and so Canadians are under attack within, um, you know, two the first two days of this, and uh, they did what they were told, which is, you know, to to try and pee into socks and stuff and cover your mouth. Uh, but even so, there are six thousand war casualties, and sixty percent of the casualties had to be sent home after the after the the first of these attacks. So it's an absolute. That's why it's called the higher form of killing, an absolutely horrendous sort of thing. And there's no protection at all until they develop the hypo helmet and uh, the letter P, the P helmet, nothing to do with, with peeing. Um, and these helmets are huge, huge helmets, look like the elephant man, with a, you know, big kind of uh, thing like this. And the thing was that, that you had to put them on horses as well because the horses died, the dogs died, the plants died, everything for miles around just went and it was gone, you know. Uh, so it, it rusted all guns and uh, metal objects as well. So if you hadn't seen wow. it come by and you'd been luckily not there when you came back, all this stuff's rusted. You're Your like, poor oh, Ross oh, rifle. Geez. Just <laughs> oh yeah, I had to mention the Ross <laughs> rifle. That's right. So uh, this is a, a horrific, horrific development, but it doesn't stop the war uh, as the Germans had hoped. And it and it turns out that after the war in the early 1930s, a German. Um, a soldier wrote his account of being on the Western Front and he said that uh, that some of their people had actually been captured and they had they had had this helmet with them and they'd they'd said something about gas but everybody just thought that's <laughs> not so you're just you know you're just havering man you're just so never even crossed their mind that, that that would be you so that's kind of interesting too um but before the hypo helmet and the p helmet were brought into production and they're you know pretty crazy looking helmets uh, the daily mail in britain urged the women of britain to do their best to make face masks so they were to make face masks out of this cotton just you know cotton batten like the the stuff you get at the top of pill boxes you know that mm -hmm. kind of stuff uh so one million of those were made and sent within weeks and uh, they killed more, even more soldiers because, of course, they you put it on your face and it concentrated the amount of stuff coming in. So it just <laughs> horrendous, horrendous things at the beginning of the war. Um, there were French African colonial troops um, there as well. One of their ranks broke, but the Canadian line held. So it really is. And this is why Canadians get such a good reputation. It really is one of these just awful, awful moments. And um, and th the thing was that the gas would lie. So it might roll towards you in no man's land, but it might kind of dip into a big shell hole. And then as you're advancing forward, you come into, you know, come up against it again. And for some some places, um, French farms that just ended up having, to, you know, being in the kind of line of battle, uh, people would months later open up the root cellar and this stuff would come out. So, it, you know, it, it really, really devastating. And there are two other. And as I said, you know, everybody gets into production. Then everyone's like, well, if you're using it, I'm using it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there are two other gases that are developed, phosgene gas and mustard gas, which does have a technical name, but um, I'll just call it mustard gas. So the Germans used phosgene in December of 1915. 
It was 18 times more powerful than chlorine gas and uh, you died within 48 hours and it was the same thing the rupturing people would cough up parts of their lungs Oof. and it's just a, a horrific way to die i think your lungs filled up with fluid so you're you're filling up with like a pint of fluid an hour so you couldn't breathe you're just it was just just awful and uh the uh, I, I don't think you could see phosgene gas but the last one that's introduced is mustard gas and you couldn't see that either but suddenly the men would say if they were smoking a cigarette, they would say their tobacco started to taste funny. It tasted like hay. And they'd be mm. like, oh, so imagine it's bad enough, the chlorine gas rolling towards you in the green cloud. But now the next two gases that are even worse, you can't see them. And uh, so you have, you have no way of knowing when you're the victim of a gas tank until, of course, you're your lungs start to go so just and for the fuzz uh, for the mustard gas uh, you got these horrible big boils all over your body and then they they all broke and suppurated all over the place plus your lungs are, are given out and just a really horrible horrible violent kind of death so uh, the allies used phosgene at the battle of the Somme and that was their first use of it July of 1916 and they released it along a 17 mile front and uh, it's said to have killed plants and animals for about 12 miles in any direction so just you know really really horrible stuff you, you forget about that I always think well you know war war is hell it'd be awful but I'd be out before they even got to that part because I'd be like oh my god fleas lice and rats huh. that's enough I'm gone you know I just can't even imagine that that you have to also deal with dead bodies beside you in the trenches and then you see them moving and you realize there's rats inside it or there's a crow inside it you know just like really really horrific things that it's no wonder that a lot of men didn't talk about this kind of thing when they when they came back home but anyway these gas attacks are a particularly horrendous part at the very start of the war and in that uh, uh, in that battle at the Somme, and in the, the first 18 days at the Somme, there were 50 gas attacks carried out. So everybody's doing it by that time. And the Canadians, of course, were at the Somme. And uh, so was the Newfoundland Regiment. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but the, the Newfoundland Regiment, Canada, of course, didn't include Newfoundland at that point. You know, Newfoundland was still separate. And uh, the Newfoundland Regiment wanted to be raised not as a Canadian troop, of course, or a British one. They wanted to go as, as Newfoundlanders. And... Um, the, this, their story is really, really horrific. I mean, they end up, they, they go to, um, they're sent to Gallipoli, then they're sent into uh, Egypt, and then they end up in the first day at the Battle of the Somme. And they, their, their story, in the, they, they're, they're sent out after the, the first attacks have been repelled. You know, the, the, the commanders, of course, believe that they had shelled the Germans for seven days and they thought they'll all be dead. They're in their trenches. They're all dead. We, we don't even need to take our, our wire cutters with, our, with us. You know, we'll just be able to walk across and we'll just take over that part of their, you know, trench thing. And, of course, the Germans had dug into like 30 feet deep and they had really substantial trenches with like bunk beds and, uh, you know, little holiday villas and stuff in it. Um, really, really well, well done. And they, they weren't uh, bothered at all after the seven days of nonstop bombing. And so they're just sitting on the other side of no man's land. The Allied troops come over. They're just like walk across and the barbed wire is only cut in a few places. And the Germans just line up their machine guns and they just start shooting. And it's it's an absolute, it's like one of the world, world's worst military disasters. Wow. So uh, there's 60,000 war casualties in the first day at the Battle of the Somme. That's, that's really, really horrendous. But the Newfoundland Regiment, because they were separate, there's a lovely documentary about this. Because they were separate, um, they were chosen by the the British to wear little silver triangles on their back. They were going to film them, so they were going to you know film their their march across no man's land. And of course, uh, because of the disaster that that happens, the Newfie regiment's actually called up, and then it's called off, and they think, well, it's going to be okay, and then they're called on again, and they they barely get to the their own front lines they just get into no man's land and of course there's nobody else moving it's just them 
by that time and there's 801 of them go over the top and within 40 minutes I think there's 68 of them left and those are mostly you know wounded and being brought back uh, just a, a, an absolute disaster of unbelievable proportions for them and then uh, one of the, the things that was even worse for them was that they had these silver triangles on their back so when they were caught in no man's land if they tried to move and the sun glinted off it they were right in the German sites and they could just pick them off so it, the whole thing is yeah. just uh, a walking nightmare uh, so you, they, you, you already know, I'm sure, that the main Allied attack was at the Somme in Picardy, and that was because the Allies had been taking, uh, uh, the French in particular, a beating at Verdun. So they had set up the, this idea that they would, they would, they would have this this huge artillery barrage uh, set for July 1st, and then they just they just bombed them nonstop. And it it says that in lots of these documentaries that, that people that lived in Dover across the English Channel could actually hear the bombing because it was just huh. non-stop and the men were just deafened by this constant constant bombing for the seven days and, and of course it hadn't really had the effect that it was supposed to have um, and the attack is although it's, it's, it's so awful uh, the attack isn't called off until there's a snowstorm in November and when it started off uh, it had um, it had involved, um, I think, at the beginning, they thought maybe three quarters of a million men. That was really, you know, saying something. Uh, and at the end, it had involved three million men, and uh, there were over a million war casualties, and, you know, quite substantial on both sides. So um, 500,000 on the German side, 200,000 French, and 400,000 British and colonial. And, and of course, uh, hardly any movement. You know, for all of that, the the Allies had twenty five thousand miles of trenches for a four hundred mile stretch of territory <laughs> from Switzerland to the Channel, and they hadn't dug in deeply. We talked about these uh, having these ex exhibition trenches. They hadn't dug in deeply because they believed that it was going to be a war of movement, and that that you know, if you if men thought they were there for good, they wouldn't even try. Whereas <laughs> the Germans were were deeply dug in uh, on the other side. So it's uh, even at the Somme, it's a, a case of thousands of men dying for maybe a couple of yards of uh, of land just just awful um and every day about seven thousand people died in the allied trenches for one reason or another so i mean there's just like kind of constant loss of life but uh, for the canadians the, the the first two really 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 big ones were um uh, were the somme or were the uh, the battle at eep and uh, there are a couple of battles at eep and then the battle at the somme but probably the one that you know the Canadians for the most is for the the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Mm -hmm. Being a bit of a Canadian yourself, a bit so, of one, yeah, yeah a bit mm -hmm. of one. You know, can't really uh, avoid that if you're if you're born in Canada. No, right, you can't yeah. at all. Yeah, and you probably you probably have. Do you have a tattoo of Vimy Ridge, or is it just a tattoo of? Uh, a maple leaf that you have. I, I don't believe. like to get into those things. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no personal disclosures or anything. No. 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 Oh. But uh, I think I think that about wraps up this part of this episode. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it. Time flies when you're talking about interesting about stuff. About stuff that happened mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> uh, join us uh, f for next time. Okay. More next.